it was a very high-tech morning in the sense that we had talks about fusion, we had talks about carbon storage, we had talks about fuel cells. And in a way that was refreshing because one of the solutions to global warming has to be technology. Fusion, it strikes me, is something that's extraordinarily exciting, potentially very expensive, but it's still quite a long way off. So that isn't the immediate answer. I think that uh, something like um, fuel cell technology probably has a whole series of applications to the transport sector, to the domestic sector. I was uh, interested in the possibility that we can store carbon under the oceans, um, in, in the oil fields of the North Sea, for example, but that's not something that can be used universally. I mean, it, it's geographically rather specific where you can do that sort of thing. And then I was also interested very much in what Professor Fells had to say about renewables. Um, it did strike me that they all have their problems, so that we have biomass requiring us to cover the whole of Kent in trees if we are to duplicate what's being done by the Dungeness nuclear power station at the moment. And if you wanted to uh, really develop the use of biofuels in California, you more or less have to cover the whole of California in fuels. And of course in Britain, where plants don't grow very fast, the amount of energy that you can develop from biofuels is quite small. And um, the, the transport costs and the processing costs in terms of using up carbon are actually quite high. So that's not a silver bullet either. Um, what is interesting, however, is the way that um, traditional nuclear power, if we can call it traditional nuclear power, is having a comeback because that does offer an almost immediate uh, solution or partial solution, both to energy shortage and to uh, the need for a lower carbon future. It's a basket or a cocktail that we're looking at. You can shave off 5% here, 5% there, and cumulatively um, that's significant. We, we can't expect tidal power to solve everything and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but equally I think um, we shouldn't make a mess in the first place. And by that I mean that rather than burning lots of black stuff, we need to burn less black stuff. And conservation of energy, energy efficiency, I still think have tremendous potential. They can be done and they need not be very expensive. I mean, our housing stock in this country is still woeful in terms, for example, of insulation. Um, it could be done if there's the will. And the housing sector is a very large part of the energy that we use. The answer as a globe is probably it's not sustainable. Um, we're looking at um, an increase in energy consumption, whatever happens, that's really rather frightening. And a lot of the energy that we're going to be consuming is going to be very dirty. I mean, Chinese coal is very low grade, and the consumption of it is going up and up. Not only will it cause problems with global warming, but also it's going to cause huge problems of acidity, pollution in cities, and so on. And that is not sustainable. And the same is going to happen more and more in India and in various other parts of the developing world. But they must develop. I was also very struck by the statistics, really, for the number of people who are killed globally, not only in cities, but, say, in African huts. I mean, the, the air quality in an African hut where you're burning rubbish and dung and, 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 and shrubs and so forth is, is terrible. I do. And I, I have two views which might at first sight appear to be rather in opposition. I mean, on the one hand, I don't think that global warming is necessarily the biggest problem that we face. I think that if you are the average African, depending on water that you carry on your head, on wood that you carry on your head, and on soils that are rapidly eroding, it's those more immediate 
issues that actually impact upon the most people and will continue to do so as population levels go up. That worries me very much. And we seem to be putting all our energies at the moment into global warming. But having said that, global warming is, to my mind, an extraordinarily serious problem, not least from the geomorphological point of view. Because the world's glaciers, the world's permafrost, the world's dunes, world river flow are all going to be impacted hugely, which will have a whole series of major environmental consequences. There's a high level of consensus and there is a very high level of probability that the scientists have now more or less got it right. Um, that brings one on to solutions. And what is good for global warming mitigation is good for many of the other big problems we face on Earth. If, for example, we take soil erosion in the tropics, biodiversity loss in the tropics, fuel wood shortage in the tropics, all these sorts of things, the solutions are actually one and the same. So what is good for us in terms of stopping global warming has many other advantages as well, and that needs to be built into the economics of the whole thing. Well, I think there are two particular things about this meeting which impress me. One is that you've got these really very stellar people who are looking at the new technologies. And that is both fascinating and important. But equally, we have people from Africa here who are, if you like, on the ground, who are facing these real and immediate problems. And it's very interesting to have those two coming along at the same time. That's really rather an original sort of thing to do. Well, in 1976, I started writing a book called Environmental Change. And then I started writing another book in the 1980s, which wasn't about natural environmental change, but human environmental change. And then in the late 80s, the university decided it wanted to take on a whole new group of initiatives. And they, 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 they went out for bids. And one that we came up with was for an environmental change unit which then became the Environmental Change Institute and then became the Oxford University Centre for the Environment. And what that's trying to do is to put the hard science and the social science together, which one has to do, and to look at certain key issues like energy, water and Africa. So there are a series of programmes there. And we have the UK Climate Impacts Programme now in Oxford, we have a big energy research centre in Oxford, a centre on biodiversity and management. And most importantly of all, we're rearing a whole new generation of master's students from all over the world who will be going off into NGOs, government departments all over the world. And when there are big environmental meetings now, as there was at The Hague not long ago, lots of our old students are there networking and making a difference. That to me is tremendously exciting and important. Well, it is fantastic that uh, things have progressed so much in the last few months, or indeed in the last couple of years. One used to be sort of out on a limb, thought to be a bit of a crank. And so the whole attitude is now changing in society, not only in Britain, but in America, in Europe. There are still some outliers, some pockets of resistance, but we are making progress. But I think we've got to be realistic. And again, one of the messages that came out today is that some of the solutions probably are not realistic. Some of the targets are not realistic. So with all this enthusiasm, it's terrific, but we need to get much more solid expectations um, organised.